Welcome to this webinar hosted by the European Humanities University in Vilnius. My name is Maximus Milta and I'm happy to introduce you to the webinar Do Countries Behave Like People? And today in this webinar that we are hosting for prospective students in political sciences, for those who are keen to study world politics and economy or the public policy program that are offered at the European Humanities University in Vilnius, we're happy to have Luis Martins from the Westminster University who will be joining us today for this webinar. It is clear that the global political context is often understood as chaotic without a world government. This reality shows us the difference between national and global politics, but what is global politics essentially? It is, I believe, uh, about global decision making and much more. But again, we should ask the question, who is involved? Nations? but who make decisions? People. So here we see an evident clash between the behavior that the national authority may exercise over various issues. And this gives it and brings even more complexity during the turbulent times of COVID-19 pandemic and many more challenges that still we are facing in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe and globally. So Luis, good to have you. Good to see you today. And uh, thank you once again for joining the webinar. My pleasure, my pleasure. Okay, so um, I, I, I would like us to start a quick overview. I will be giving you more or less of, a, of an assessment of the last 10 years of um, what could be considered the um, chaos of global politics around the world. Um, we will move on then to try to understand what is global politics and then eventually look into this analogy between uh, the behavior of nations and the behavior of people uh, through the perspective of classic theories of global politics or international relations, okay? Um, I'll be focusing a lot in, in, in examples so that the students can somehow link uh, real events with um, global politics as such, okay? Um, so the assessment, the global reality, okay? Let's start with Europe. Um, think with me, a looming refugee crisis starting in the aftermath of the Syrian civil war and spreading throughout. When, when actually people in Europe were barely recovering from a strong economic crisis starting in 2008, 2009 and looming till up 2016. Try to think about, for example, a very recent event, COVID-19 pandemics, which obviously changed the way how nations behave in Europe was no exception. Or try to think at the level of ideas, you know, think about the rise of populism and how that affected uh, countries like Italy with Mr. Salvini uh, in, the, in the heart of the hurricane, or even in France uh, with Marine Le Pen and her national uh, uh, front or Le Front uh, National. Uh, or even if you go uh, more to the east and you will find Viktor Orban in Hungary and, and uh, Mr. Kaczynski in Poland uh, or even Mr. Wilders in, in Holland. I mean, we can go across, across Europe and find the rise of populism and, and the way how it affects real ongoing politics, okay? If we were to move elsewhere and look into the north of Africa, we would find Libya pretty much in a state of civil war as we speak, okay? Um, a civil war which is the outcome of French, American and British intervention in 2011 in the middle of the Arab Spring, okay? If we move next door to Algeria, you see uh, civil unrest because uh, their president, Mr. Bouteflika, decided to run for the fifth time uh, to, to, do, to the election, a man who actually was the first and only politician who won elections whilst in coma. So it's, it's something unbelievable. You move to Egypt and you have more problems in terms of, for example, how the military regime became the political regime under Mr. Mr. Uh, Al-Sisi. And this is just to give you an account of the north of Africa. If we were to go down to the Horn of Africa and look into Somalia or Congo, more in the heart of it, you will find more unrest, okay? If we move to the Middle East, the elephant in the room, the Arab, uh, Palestinian-Israel uh, conflict, the uh, clashes between Iran and Iraq and of course the US, um, the very uh, uh, proxy war, which basically means a war by representation or procuration between um, Saudi Arabia and Iran in Yemen. We're talking about constant unrest in the region, 
Um, if we were to eventually move on to a more global level, we need to look into, for instance, climate change and, 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 and the very idea of, of global climate change as a problem which affects us all. Same could be said about COVID-19. So if you look into all of these examples, guys, what you find is what we call the free use, unrest, unpredictability, and uncertainty. And these free use, let me tell you, that somehow really explain, let's say, what we call the anarchical order of the world of politics, okay? Um, why anarchical? Well, because first of all, anarchy entails absence of government, which eventually is the case at the global level. There is no government. If you think the UN is the government, you're wrong. The UN is not the government of the world. Some may say unfortunately, others may say fortunately, it is not the case. So if you compare global politics with national politics, the main difference is that national politics or in national politics, we have a clear cut government, be it elected or not, be it democratic or not, there's a clear cut hierarchy, whereas in global politics, there isn't such a thing, okay? And such is the complexity of the whole process. And that's why eventually it is very difficult for global politics or international relations to be predicted or to at least have an element of order. And that's why we call it anarchical, okay? Um, but since we talk about this, we need to think about the actors of global politics, okay? So I want you to imagine a stage, like a theater stage. Who's in there? Let's call it the, 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 the global politics play. Okay, um, first of all, nation states, countries as we know them and their governments. After that, you will find what we call non-state actors. Okay, among them, you will find terrorist groups. Examples, Boko Haram in Cameroon, for example, ISIS, the very well-known case spread in Syria and in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, you will find Al-Shabaab, in Somalia, which basically has rendered Somalia what we call a failed state. A failed state is basically a state in which there is no central organization and it's basically the image of um, anarchy, chaos, okay? And then you've got uh, multinational corporations, huge global players, for example, Microsoft or Nike or even Coca-Cola or Intel or Citigroup. You will find lots of, 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 of multinational corporations with a role to play in, in global politics. Uh, I can't forget uh, uh, Alphabet, uh, uh, the mother company of Google, which of course is, is also a huge player. Uh, so of course, and finally you will find NGOs, non-governmental organizations like Red Cross or UNICEF or Amnesty International. So all of these actors, they turn around on the stage of global politics. Such is the complexity of it. Okay. Um, it is very understand that this complexity dictates then the behavior of nations as such. Okay, but before I get there, let me tell you indeed what is global politics. Okay, so first of all, global politics is about the decisions that are made at the global level. Okay, who makes those decisions? Are they accountable? Are they uh, legitimate? Who's in charge? Who decided? Why? What is the agenda behind? It's also about problem solving. Okay, trying to understand uh, how, for instance, um, the threat of terrorism, or again, the more recent issue of COVID-19 is dealt with, okay? Are countries um, acting globally or nationally? I mean, the good example is, is to see, for instance, how eventually some countries are chasing a vaccine, uh, thinking that, you know, if they get there first, eventually they benefit from it, when, when in fact, uh, you know, even if they get there first, but others aren't actually treated with it, the problem isn't solved at all. So, you know, we have this, this sort of clash between national interests and global challenges all the time. Um, but it's also about resolving disputes, okay? It's about, for instance, trade, territory, uh, the movement of people. I mean, an example, a simple example, think about 2014, and the invasion of, of uh, Crimea in Ukraine. 
Um, I mean, what to do? It's a clear-cut case of a nation invading and taking away a piece of other nation. We won't discuss the arguments, we don't have enough time for that, but ultimately it depicts a good example of uh, problems that become global, because it's not just Ukraine and Russia involved, it's clearly a regional issue that then becomes a global issue in itself, okay? Because then eventually different allies will behave differently in the face of the problem. For instance, the US and the European Union straight away that throws sanctions in Russia, okay? So again, remember, it's a spillover effect. It's like a domino effect when we talk about global politics. But I'll move on. Um, it's also about resources, okay? Uh, the uh, dealing and management of resources. Um, you know, for instance, we can think of uh, the way how, um, a simple example, did you know that Apple, to make our beautiful iPhones, actually extracts cobalt, which is a substance mostly found in Congo, okay? So ultimately, there's a huge, um, let's say, exploitation of workers' rights, and I, I could tell you more about it if we were to have time, in order to have our iPhones uh, and make the world um, round, uh, uh, around Apple itself. So again, management of resources. If you want another example, uh, probably you've heard about the Mekong River, which basically starts in China, and goes all the way down, passing through Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, B uh, Burma, and eventually the way how the Chinese deal with the um, flow of the river will affect the food chain of all of these countries down the stream. Okay, A simple action such as building a dam will affect the livelihood of millions of people down the stream. Okay, so another example of the complexities of global politics. And of course, you know, we need to think about uh, who decides these issues. So if, if global politics is very much about decision making, who decides? Okay, and then we become more, we move on to a more anthropological or let's say a more human level. Okay, uh, let me tell you who decides, people like us probably not as nice as we are, but eventually they were elected and we are stuck in a Zoom window, okay? Uh, but they're people just like us. Um, eventually, nations, just like people, they only differ on the level and grade of power, okay? For example, Pope Francis is a much more powerful figure than I am. His discourses access millions of people around this world. Mine access a few students every time I give a lesson, okay? If we were to compare, for instance, the power of China or the power of, for example, Spain, we would have two very different examples still, okay? So it's a degree of power that differentiates the impact that countries or nations have in global politics. Remember, more power you have, greater the freedom, to act unilaterally, okay? Unilaterally means you act by your own decision and devices, okay? More power you have, more you tend to do that. Just look into the behavior of America of the last 30 years and you have a picture, a perfect picture of, of what I'm trying to tell you. But I'm gonna give you more examples. But remember, from this unilateral action, it increases the anarchy, okay? They're directly proportional more countries act unilaterally, unexpectedly, greater is the anarchical order of global politics. Examples. The Iraq invasion of the US and UK in 2003. The UN saying don't do that. Everyone saying don't do that. George W. Bush and Tony Blair did it. They invented nuclear weapons which didn't exist and they went inside. Uh, a, a more recent example. Uh, China built artificial islands in the South China Sea only to pretend that they were natural and that they belonged to them, so that actually they would control the whole sea. Of course, didn't turn out very well. I'll tell you more afterwards. And of course, the example of Russia in, in Crimea, as well as in Georgia in 2008. Okay. Um, there's a golden rule here, guys. And the golden rule is the strong do what they can, the weak 
suffer what they must. This golden rule comes with a founding text of global politics by Thucydides. It's called the, the Peloponnesian War. It's a very interesting book. It basically tells you how Greece and Sparta were already playing global politics, very much so how America, China, uh, and Russia play today, for example. Okay? That said, this brings us to what we call realism. Okay? So this behavior, this turmoil, is basically what we call realism. Realism is a theory which states that ultimately states, nation states, behave only in accordance with their national interests. Nation states are the main actor, says realism. N uh, treaties and uh, 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 intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations, like the European Union, they are less important because nation states are the key players and their national interests, the sole criteria of behavior. Okay, very important to have in mind. Um, I'll go back now to the example of China. Okay, so the Chinese built these artificial islands. They pretended that they were in charge of the sea around it because international law says that, you know, if you have a piece of land, the sea around it is yours at a certain point. So the International Criminal Court said, I'm sorry, but your islands are artificial. You can't claim it's yours, and the sea belongs to all other countries around as well. Guess what China did in retaliation to that? Nothing. Which means what? Remember, the International Criminal Court may actually state verdicts, but remember, in the absence of a world government, no one is going to tell the big powers how to behave. So the Chinese carried on, they still have those islands. But Hold on, what happened next? Americans wanted to prove the point that those islands are not in Chinese waters. They are in international waters. So what did they do? They had um, uh, their huge uh, 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 um, uh, vessels and they literally entered with those big ships, those vessels, in at what they called international waters, but the Chinese called Chinese waters. So they went there, they keep doing that to prove the point that it's not Chinese sea. Whereas the Chinese, at a certain point, a couple of years ago, put their vessels right in front of the American vessels. And literally, you might think I'm exaggerating, I'm not, we almost had an accident because both ships decided to go against each other, and one of them turned at the very end avoiding an all-out war between America and China. This is how fragile this anarchical order is. Okay, um, so what's my point? What happens with realism and realist behavior? It generates more realist behavior, okay? Because national interests clash, all right? I want to move on. So my question is to you now, looking into this behavior, how different is this from, for instance, the kindergarten, okay? Um, two kids fighting over a toy, um, or even, you know, public transports when we try to almost run and try to get the empty seat, okay? Or even daily business. What's my point here? And I'll make my point a bit clear further on, but the idea is that when you look into the behavior of nations, you could almost, if you close your eyes, think of two people doing exactly the same thing under different circumstances. Okay, if you think I'm exaggerating, I'm gonna give you another example. Let's go to Pakistan and India, two neighboring countries with a history of conflict, okay? Here's how it works, guys. Pakistan builds a nuclear weapon, India builds two. Pakistan builds three, India builds four. Pakistan makes um, uh, uh, gun and weapon contracts and defense contracts with China. India does the same with America. They are armed to their teeth in what we call the security dilemma. One gets a gun, the other one gets a gun. One gets 10, the other one gets 10. Now, are we talking about two countries or two people here? Because I could think of many people behaving in a very same way. For example, in regards to the most trivial things such as a car. My neighbor has a car. 
I want a car just like my neighbor. My brother has a house. I want a house just like him. There's a lot of human behavior in the collective behavior of nations. The analogy might be forced. I admit that. But think, it's so simple. The behavior is so simple that, again, if we were to close our eyes, we are no longer talking about Pakistan and India, but one person and another person. Okay? But I'll move on. I'll, maybe my argument will, will become more clear. Um, against all of this, against realism, we can speak of liberalism on the very other side of the spectrum. Instead of focusing on national interests, liberalism focuses on cooperation. Okay? They claim that um, nation states can better achieve their goals through cooperation, okay? trade, commerce. Okay? A good example is the European Union. Probably you know, you, you, you've heard of this before, but Europeans hate each other. Okay? Um, if you didn't know that, you got to know right now. Um, the story of Europe, though, the history of Europe, is a history of blood. Okay? Uh, what you now call the European Union members, they hated each other for centuries and they used to fight pretty much every day. Okay? The happy history of the European Union started only after the Second World War with the founding of the European Union, because eventually Europeans understood that making money, it's also a way of living their lives instead of killing. Okay? The European Union was born. So what's my point? It's a liberal model, a liberal strategy. Okay, yes, of course, many European Union members still act out of their own national interests, but they do not disregard the whole. Liberalism generates codependency, interdependency. Okay, and the EU is a good example. I could give you other examples. The EU, the EU is a political and economic uh, and, and a security uh, alliance. Uh, if we move on to, for instance, uh, the um, uh, America, Canada and Mexico agreement, also now known as Uzmeca, used to be called NAFTA, uh, you see only an economic agreement. Okay? There's no free movement of people. There's only goods and only certain goods that are traded between. Okay? That's liberalism. All right. If you look into NATO, if you look into the African Union, the Arab League, these are examples of countries coming together and reaching their interests through cooperation. That's liberalism. Diplomacy, basically, down the line. All right. Now, um, I, I want to pass the message here in a very obvious way. We, do, we shall not drown on this either or. Are you a realist? Are you a liberal? Uh, are countries realists? Are countries liberal? Because in reality, nation states, as much as people, act in both ways. Okay? That's an important thing, all right? To survive as a nation or as an individual, you will understand that um, you often employ realist and liberal strategies simultaneously. Okay? I'll give you an example. It's a very recent example, a perfect example for this. Um, I'm going to give the example of the UK now, but I'm sure this happened also uh, in your countries, in, or at least countries you know. As soon as the COVID-19 pandemic started to spread, people started to run to supermarkets. Okay? They started to queue in supermarkets. I saw people walking on the street with piles of toilet paper okay, here in London. People started to buy anything they could buy. Soon, the shelves were empty, but some people's um, storage rooms were full. Cans, toilet paper, and so on. So ultimately, everyone thought of their family first, of themselves first. We're not judging this morally. We are looking into the empirical side of things. People acted uh, in a realist way. Buy, buy, store, and eventually, you know, protect yourself for the future. Now, this was a realist element. The beauty of it was that the very same people who emptied all the shelves started to organize volunteer groups to bring stuff door to door to the disadvantage. Okay, so ultimately, you see people, the same people who are probably carrying those toilet paper on the street are now volunteering and delivering stuff uh, behind the door of the elderly. Okay, the liberal strategy.
So what am I trying to say? Human behavior does that, and so does collective behavior at the level of nations. There is no contradiction here, guys. You can be a realist and a liberal either as an individual or as a country, okay? I'm going to finalize with an example. It's called, probably you've heard of it, it's called the uh, Belt and Road Strategy. Um, the Belt and Road Strategy is a Chinese strategy which consists of, as we speak, invest in around 70 countries, building roads, building harbors, building factories, bridges, football stadiums. I mean, the Chinese are investing billions in infrastructure around the world, okay? Beautiful, liberal. Here's a way of making money. Here's a way of benefiting from this. Great stuff, okay? What's the other side? What's the realist side? Here we go. One, the Chinese do that because ultimately they have an agenda. They, have, they want to exert an element of uh, global, let's say, um, influence. But at the same time, they deal with, with each country differently. For example, Tajikistan couldn't pay back the Chinese for their hard work. So what did they do? They gave, they gave them territory thousands of square kilometers given to China as a way of pay because they didn't have the money to do that, okay? If we go to Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka couldn't pay back. So China got a harbor in the heart of Sri Lanka, in the middle of the Indian Ocean, a lease of 99 years, okay? Let's go to Pakistan. Pakistan can't pay back China. So they are in what we call a debt trap, which means what? The Chinese call the shots because Pakistan can't pay back, okay? So all of these examples, guys, alongside another one, and I'll finalize with that one, Djibouti in the Horn of Africa, right next to Somalia. Djibouti gave China a naval base. So the Chinese can now float in the Indian Ocean freely, which again, before them, only the Americans could do, okay? So all of these issues, all of these examples, and the Chinese strategy surely is not too far away from the very same strategy that I gave you about people during COVID-19 in the sense that they're realist and they're liberals because survival and influence eventually depend from that, okay? Eventually, and in conclusion, and I promise to stop here and you guys can ask whatever you want, what, you, what I want you to think is that nation states are ultimately what, what uh, Benedict Anderson called imagined communities. You know, these imaginary groups of people with a defined culture, language, et cetera, et cetera, but they are not an abstract thing. They are what the sum of the decisions of their governments entail, okay? The behavior of nations is not an abstract behavior. It's human behavior. And you can see that in all of the examples I've given you throughout the last 20, 30 minutes. And eventually, the fact that we humans are unpredictable, that makes nations equally unpredictable. And again, we enter into this anarchical world order based on unpredictability, uncertainty, and unrest. Okay? I finish here with a simple thought. Whenever you think of nation states, try to imagine a human face and the way how it behaves. And eventually that will make the collective behavior of that nation more clear to you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. That was a very nicely delivered introduction to try and to understand deeper for those who have been listening to you this webinar, how nation states do behave in this rapidly changing world that we live and at least i have uh, three questions to you but clearly uh, i'll be over also happy to pass the floor to anyone else having questions so i'll start with uh, this one mm -hmm. if we have if we pay attention on how the world that we live in used to look like in the late 19th century so we would be probably surprised that just before the first world war anyone practically could travel freely there were no visas needed you could easily travel from saint petersburg to lisbon just by taking a train and no stamps no passport control nothing of that kind was needed 
you could travel almost uh, freely. You could trade uh, practically without any taxes or levies applied. So the whole world uh, would almost look like like a uh, like like a br broad uh, free economic zone in that regard. And then suddenly, after the First World War, the world we know nowadays becomes very different. You start needing visas everywhere. You are not able to trade freely. Every nation starts to expand their, uh, you know, their isolationist policies, and that becomes even more in, uh, even more stimulated uh, after the economic crisis and Great Depression of 1929. My question to you is that uh, just before COVID-19, those of us living in Europe, those of us living in the Western world whatever the West stands for, but in the global West, right? Uh, we got to used to, to the life that uh, brings advantages of traveling freely, trading freely, uh, finding the best possible opportunities to exploit our talents and characters. Would your assessment be that uh, the world after COVID-19 would no more be the world where you could exercise those liberties freely as we were used to just before uh, March 2020 here in Europe. Mm -hmm. Fair point. Fair point. I mean, there's there's a lot of um, of, of, a special, of specialists speaking about this topic as we speak. I believe I believe that this COVID-19 pandemic, unfortunately, in my opinion, has been a fantastic moment and phenomenon to help those inside of different countries steer away from any kind of global politics and focus on the national, okay? I'm gonna give an example. I think that, for example, any nationalist in any country, for instance, in Italy, Salvini is already using COVID-19 uh, and making politics with it. And so is Trump in America, by the way, uh, although for the, wrongest, the, the most wrong reasons you can think of. But I believe that politicians will use this situation to strengthen their discourses and eventually the aftermath the outcome of that will depend on the collective choice of the electorate so what i think is that the element of fear the element of suspicion the element of xenophobia the element of um let's say caution that that was generated by covid19 will help those nationalist movements and parties to push the agenda to allow countries to basically steer away from their neighbors and the wider world okay now will they be successful this is the question some of them will and then the question is who are they which countries are we talking about because for example if a couple of european union members thinking about the european example will go that way you know i can think of for instance um, spain and italy or spain and france that means that the whole of the european union will suffer okay if it's for example you know hungary and poland less influential than france for instance i don't see a massive problem at the eu level but i see a regional problem so what's my point whoever will use this card has now strengthened their hand and they can be successful if they will be successful then politics as we know it will change but remember the key challenges of our world are all global you know no one is going to tackle climate change nationally you can't do that no one's going to tackle covid 19 nationally you can't do that okay so what's my point here even if countries will steer the wheel towards that direction it's to their own detriment, you know, it's not going to work. It's an ideological choice that has been proved to be counterproductive. If you close yourself, you are not going to help yourself in the long term. And uh, in fact, uh, thank you for, for answering because you have just brought us to the second question of mine and exactly something I wanted to ask your opinion of is the case of the European Union. In the EU, even before pandemic, we have seen uh, the situation where separate member states of the EU, uh, namely Poland and Hungary, have been consistently 
executing policies that were undermining the values embodied in the treaty of the function of the European Union, in the treaty on the European Union. Let's, let's talk about the independ uh, independence of judiciary in Poland. We talk about uh, the freedom of media. We talk about all other attacks that have been executed, executed by the Hungarian government on NGOs and functioning of uh, also higher educational institutions and universities like the yeah. Central European University. Yeah. But at the same time, these two countries, they remain full members of the European Union, right? Their voting rights in the council were not suspended. There was only a minor threat, but it was not finally implemented, right? Mm -hmm. By the European Court of Justice. And at the end, what we have got is a situation where you have this supranational entity called the European Union, something we all value and cherish because this is an undoubted um, achievement, enormous achievement of European so uh, civilization, which is enormously interdependent between all of its 27 member states. But some of these member states, they, despite being interdependent both ways, they are undermining the values that I embodied there. And here we find a certain paradox is that more and more populist movements in different parts of the European Union, they can start raising a debate uh, by bringing examples of these two Central European countries. Maybe that would become less uh, successful uh, whenever this happens in France or in uh, Germany, countries that are, well, relatively large in all terms possible. But whenever we talk about the smaller member states, then these examples, they can be very, uh, very, very, very challenging for the further existence of the European Union. Now, my question to you in this regard is how do you assess the situation of interdependence within the liberal established political order and uh, the institution driven arrangement as the European Union is and the uh, new traditionalist uh, policies that are implemented by authorities locally. How shall we do about this? What political scientists or scientists are telling us? Okay. Look, first, um, we need to talk about timings here, okay? Which is the following. If, if Brexit wouldn't have happened, we would see a much stronger European Union or European Commission and courts dealing with what's going on in Hungary and Poland, okay? This is the first one. Brexit weakened the supranationality of the European Union because once Britain is gone, eventually, if you think of a, ca of a, of a card castle, you don't want to see all the cards falling through. So you've got to be careful there, okay? Um, so timing is important. I do not think that, for example, um, if, the, if Britain wouldn't have left the EU, Poland and Hungary would have done with what they've done so far. Okay, at least not without a bigger challenge. Now, your main question is, how do we actually, uh, in the context of the EU, how does the national fit with the supranational? It's not perfect. I mean, the EU is not perfect. We tend to forget that just because it's rich, it's perfect. It's not. Okay, I think that we will move on a case by case as we go in order to maintain the structure intact. But you are right. I mean, when is enough enough? I mean, we see Poland um, attempting against their judicial system, unthinkable by the founding fathers of the European Union. You see Orban in, 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 in Hungary, uh, you know, using the word illiberal democracy, which is just funny. It's funny how he gets away with this. Um, and then you see the, the growth of these populist movements. And I guess that my, my previous censor could almost fit to this question as well, uh, Maximus, because you see, if we see the rise of the alternative for Germany in Germany, the rise of the National Front in France, the rise of Vox in Spain, the rise of, of uh, Wilders and the far right in Holland, uh, the rise of Salvini in Italy, we're talking about right-wing governments, extreme right-wing governments with very little interest in the European Union. Okay, so if these governments were to become a reality, then clearly the local, the national, will destroy from within uh, the supranationality of the European Union. If they will remain in the margins, I believe that the European Union has the capacity to absorb 
these idiosyncrasies, these differences. Now, a good example for that is the fact that this week, uh, Merkel and, and Macron came up with their, uh, again, representing France and Germany, the two key pillars of the EU and founding fathers, uh, came up with a 500 billion uh, euro plan uh, to help the whole EU zone in the aftermath of COVID-19. This is a very positive note. But then again, remember, now we have Sweden, Austria, uh, Sweden, Austria, and Holland saying that they're not sure whether they will approve this. You know, so again, you know, we're no longer talking about Hungary and Poland here. We're talking about beacons of democracy now saying that they're not sure whether they agree with the plan because their national interest is not to do it. Okay, so the, the dichotomy realism, liberalism, is still very much in the heart of the EU. So far, liberalism has won the fight. Will it win tomorrow? I don't know. And probably the final question from my side, and also it's a pleasure to see that we've got comments from Facebook. So I'll just read aloud the comment from Facebook and uh, we'll address my question. And the comment is, indeed, the international system is an anarchy since we don't have any supreme power in the global world. But neoclassical realists explain uh, state behavior through the ideas of complexity of the states and ideas of structure in the contrary to the classical realism where states perceived as unitary actors. Well, it's a good comment. It's a comment by, under, uh, by a graduate of world politics and economy, uh, Georgi Barishnikov, who have graduated last year, if I'm not mistaken, our program. Probably we could follow up on that comment, but uh, my small uh, addition to, to our conversation with you, Luis, is following. Uh, you remember the Greek debt crisis of, um, 2015, if I'm not mistaken, right? And in the turn of Greek debt crisis, uh, we have observed Syriza, right, come into power, and uh, Prime Minister Tsipras being at the rule of Greece, we, who is, by the way, a, a manifestation of not center-right, but center-left, or very much to the left politician, right? And uh, not surprisingly enough, but uh, during the last elections in Greece, Syriza didn't won, uh, didn't won any significant share of votes and uh, we have things back on track with more or less classical center-right EPP member uh, turning to the power. So probably this pendulum effect that happens whenever any substantial crisis occurs uh, could also help in a certain way uh, for uh, member states of the European Union to get back to the new normal, but just uh, some in, in upcoming years. That's, that could be uh, wishful thinking, but I hope that pendulum effect will serve its purpose for us. Would you, would you agree on pendulum effect or, or that's too optimistic? I mean, I, you see, I, 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 like, I like optimism, or I used to, to like optimism until I, I witnessed in the same year uh, the Brexit referendum and the rise of Trump. And by the way, I was, I was actually holding myself not to say Trump the whole webinar, and I've just lost it. Um, so I used to be an optimist until I saw that, you see, and the reality is that if we were to do a global assessment to the, um, the consolidation of these movements, I'm not too sure about the pendulum effect because the pendulum, the pendulum effect depends on a, cer a certain independent mind or independent mindedness of the electorates because they're the ones who shift left and right, who shift here and there. And what we're witnessing more and more, especially in the global West, as you're saying, but not just the global West, is the fact that the, the, you know, the hand is moving less and less. It used to be like this, but now the, this is what we call a polarization um, of, of sides, which is you know, very well seen in America, but not just America. There seems to be a sort of um, fixed, frozen sides that refuse to go here or there. What I'm trying to say is that this pendulum might not work anymore because more and more people have made their minds and decided what, who to support and where to support and what causes to support, regardless of the evidence. So, you know, a good example again is Trump. Trump does not care about what Americans think. He cares about what his base of support thinks. And he caters for them all these decisions have in mind people that vote for him regardless. 
okay? So what I'm trying to say here is that I would like to be optimistic, but people are no longer, and here I'm generalizing, free thinking to the point of changing sides depending on events as such. I think that in here I'm going on a tangent. Social networks, the elephant in the room, have made this pattern even more clear by grouping people in what we call, you know, the bubble effect, the echo chambers and so on. We could carry on and talk about this. People are no longer willing to change sides as they used to. Okay, in Greece, we saw that, uh, but Greece eventually was in chaos. So Syriza was a good solution to come, off, to come of it, uh, but no longer a solution to deal with it. That reminds me, Churchill wins the Second World War and then he loses an election because he's not seen as the guy who's going to drive this country to a better place. He's seen as the guy to fight a war. So, you know, um, no, optimism these days is the difficult thing. Um, and I fear that the growth of populism, and by the way, guys, populism is not a right-wing ideology. It's, a, it's what we call a thin ideology. It goes left and right, okay? It goes anywhere. It's pretty much like COVID-19, if I were to crack a silly joke. Um, and therefore, depending on what populism does and its success, our levels of optimism should go up and down, I would say. Very well. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Now, I see that Paul has a question. Please, Paul, carry on. <clears throat> so, uh, returning to the point of realism in order of international relations, you know, from my point of view, I see a really pessimist, really horrifying tendency in international relations between, I mean, the, 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 first, the first example is about, you know, this Xinjiang uh, Uyghur autonomous region in China, where the Chinese government created all, almost concentration camps for people yep. and there are like for two million people are here uh, staying there and like nobody cares almost mm -hmm. and you know um, the story goes in a spiral and uh, from you do you think that United Nations mm, in this mm, becoming of power powerless and like almost important in, uh, in order to solve in the conflicts all around the world, you know, there is Crimea, there is uh, and other things like in, as we see in Xinjiang, and uh, nobody doing nothing because you mentioned really uh, great that nation states, especially power states, are going to um, do whatever they want and they don't want to see any, they don't care on any rela international reaction and you know, do you think that the United Nations are repeating the mistakes of League of Nations in the beginning of the 20th century? Because, you know, um, everybody knows what happened after the League of Nations declined. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that the story will go in a spiral? Okay, nice one, Paul, nice one. Lots of things there. Um, okay, first, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the minority uh, uh, Uyghur, uh, is, is very much suffering at the hands of, of the Chinese government. You're right, it's unbelievable and hidden. Um, but worse than that, just as a side note, is actually the credit, social credit system uh, being developed by the Chinese government. I suggest you, you research, it's quite interesting, which basically consists of tracking uh, the nation's behavior and um, creating a social credit for each and every single citizen, which can actually even shape the way how you travel and you live your life, including getting, getting any credit or a mortgage from the bank, okay? It's very much like a, a Black Mirror, a TV series in uh, one of their episodes. Now, on a more serious note, uh, uh, put it like this, um, the problem of, League of, Na of, League of, Na of the League of Nations was actually twofold. One, Americans weren't part of it, although they had the idea. And two, um, they, they, they didn't focus on the essential point of preventing war at all costs, okay? The United Nations improved from that because of the failure of the League of Nations. So I like to see it in this way, Paul, see if you agree. The United Nations, in order to keep uh, the membership alive. So in order to prevent countries from leaving, 
because that was also part of the problem of the League of Nations. It traded an element of power. What I'm trying to say is that they got weaker because they were focused on keeping everyone within, which they have succeeded thus far. But of course, the price to pay is they're just a symbol. Okay, now, do I see the same happening to the United Nations? I don't think so, at least not during Guterres' leadership. Guterres seems to be a very, a very diplomatic leader. But again, a change of leadership, a change of uh, leadership in the UN, a change of leadership in the main um, uh, actors of world politics, America, uh, Russia, China, and so on, or even a clash between the existing ones, say Xi Jinping and Trump, or, or even Putin and, and, and Trump, which I doubt, um, we could see something akin to huge damage to the UN. I mean, I'm thinking of if China were to leave, if the US were to leave. Um, I mean, the US, have in mind, the US has already uh, cut funding in several programs of the United Nations, okay? Trump has made more cuts than, than anyone else before him in America. It's a poor sign, okay? So we could analyze this evidence. I think it's too simplistic to think about a repetition of history. Although we do need to think that eventually um, this is a possibility, okay? Um, but I don't know, I don't know, it's a hard call. I like to think beyond the repetition of history, although it does happen every now and then. I agree with you, Paul. Uh, but we need to keep an eye on it. I hope not. I mean, look, we don't have a world government. We have like, you know, a symbol, a world symbol. It's the UN. We should at least strive to keep that symbol. Um, and that's my, my take on that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. But uh, do you think that actu the actual international law is becoming more like a fiction, more like a, you know uh, a, a, a piece of paper where the people are just the, the nation states who are like like they declaring that they uh, so we we pursue the international law, but actually it's not the it's not the thing that they need to leave the UN. They can, they could be in the UN, but they want Sorry. and they will be uh, having their own business, you know? Um, put it like this. I, it's a hard call, that one. International law has always been weak. Let's have no illusions. Uh, but again, you're, I mean, as you're saying, Unilateral actions weaken international law even further. Okay, so let me just open my door here. Sorry, I had someone knocking on my door. This is the new new technologies. I have to take that into account. Um, so, Paul, unilateral action leads to weakening of international law. This is a no-brainer. Okay. Um, but I want to bring something else because you mentioned that. When we talk of international law, we need to talk about the Security Council at the United Nations. Okay. And I think that the Security Council or the way how it works, it's the perfect depiction of what is great about it and what's wrong about it. Okay. It's like, it's like the, the supreme contradiction. It's great that they sit on the same table. It's great that they're all there and no one leaves because otherwise we would have another League of Nations. But at the same time, it's not great that they only agree whenever they feel like, which means very little, okay? So what's my point here? If international law is uh, what the UN states or what the Security Council allows, it's very little, it's very poor, it's very fragile. And of course, that, that contributes to the anarchical world order, in my understanding. Thank you very much, Luis. Thank you, Paul. I imagine uh, something that could be also added to this discussion is this uh, certain debate that has been happening about the voting system in the Security Council, whether qualified majority voting system, for example, would be a trigger for uh, empowering the United Nations with uh, enforcement right, authority. Uh, and something similar debate has been happening in, in the Council, right, of the European Union, in the European Council. Yeah. 
when it, when it comes to uh, shifting more to the qualified majority vote. But uh, we've got a question from Facebook. So I've got to, I've got, I've got I would like to, to speak, uh, to, to, to ask it uh, to you, Luis. Um, don't you think that uh, the rise of the populism in the European Union is an outcome of the democratic deficit in the European Union. Hmm. Um, mathematically, no, because if think logically, if they exist, it's because they had an access point. So if populist, look, this is a long debate. There's a long debate. I've had this discussion with many colleagues of mine, maybe yourself, Maximus, um, you know, Many, many specialists, they say that we should sideline and keep certain parties or movements away from the rule of law and the game of politics, okay? That means that, you know, the likes of, of Alternative for Germany or uh, National Front or all the uh, far right wing uh, would be excluded from the game of politics. That, in my opinion, would be undemocratic. So my point being, the fact that they play the game is not a sign of democratic deficit. It's a sign that the game is working, but more and more people are adhering to their ideas. And then, of course, you know, they can always claim this is democracy. If people like our ideas, it's because we are doing very well. So in no way, I think that there is a democratic deficit in here. I mean, what you can argue for the democratic deficit argument is that, um, you know, if people are upset, if people are frustrated with certain issues, it's because their voices haven't been heard. Okay, I can see that argument, but wait a second. That has always been the case, because democracy is like that. Some voices are heard, we call them the winners, those who win the election. Other voices are not heard, we call them the losers of that election. It's a tyranny of majority. You know, it's an old Tocquevillian and John Stuart Millian idea that basically explains democracy as it is. So, no, I don't bite the democratic deficit because they're here. You know, they're playing the game. We, we can put our cross there. Why should there be a deficit in there? Right. But at the same time, I imagine that um, the example of uh, the failure of a Spitzenkandidat a case for 2019 uh, European Parliament elections probably is one of the triggers why uh, people in certain EU member states, they... Uh, they are raising questions on this, uh, uh, on the role of, you know, bureaucratic Brussels, which is uh, predominantly unelected, right? That is determining in many ways, ways and forms how we live. And in the good days, in the good times, probably you can deal with that pretty well because this takes off uh, from your shoulders your responsibility for decision making. But whenever uh, tough time, uh, tough times arise, then you start raising questions, right? And in this uh, instance, clearly this is a continuous debate that's been happening across the um, founding of the coal and steel communities, right? Uh, which bodies of the European Union should be elected? What is the level of representation? And we remember well that in the beginning, the European Parliament was not elected at all. These were a national parliament that were delegating their members, but still it's a long way, lo long way ahead. Would you agree with that? Yeah, of course, but, 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 but your point insists on the, um, the need to democratize institutions, which obviously, you know, we do need to do that in terms of, of the EU as a supranational institution. I fully agree with that. But the point of democratic um, deficit stems from national politics first. And uh, my answer is still true in regards to the reality of national politics. We might claim that there is a, an institutional democratic deficit at the EU with arguments, but again, we go back to the point, what is the EU? It's the reality that each of its member states contributes to it. So if there is room for um, uh, uh, democracy, for populism in democracy at national level, there must be room for um, populism, again, as a big term, um, at the EU level. I mean, if you want the best example to sustain what I'm saying, see how, for example, UKIP, the right-wing populist representative of UK, has always been the most represented party in the European Union Parliament, okay? And, and, and you know, this is objectively true, and plus, 
their presence was so important that is basically the engine of the Brexit itself, okay, by the person of Nigel Farage. So, you know, no, I don't bite the democratic deficit. Look into how do you keep undermine British politics from the EU perspective. Do you know, Maximus, how many uh, MPs UKIP has elected in the history of British politics at national level? How many? Uh, it's, yes, it's either big one zero. Yes. A big zero. They had one who basically left the Conservatives and stayed there for a few months, but it was not, was not elected by them. So, you know, they were populists through the EU backfiring to the United Kingdom. Okay, so I guess my argument uh, is still there, but you have a point. Institutionally, it's not enough. And maybe that is in people's minds as well whenever the discourse about leaving the European Union comes through. This has been a very vibrant debate and we uh, have spent this hour indeed in a very vibrant and very lively discussion. I enjoyed it a lot and I'm quite confident that those of you who are watching this webinar either online on our Facebook page or watching it on the YouTube account of the European Humanities University. Just keep in mind once again that if you are eager to deal more and more consistently with the sorts of questions that today Luis and I and Paul were raising, please consider World Politics and Economy, the undergraduate program at the European Humanities University as your potential uh, academic pathway. The applications for this program are accepted until July 5th. And it's a very easy process to apply for to study at EHU. You can do it straight away from home in a fully in a distance mode. Otherwise, if you already have got an undergraduate degree, you may consider public policy program at the European Humanities University, which is one and a half year master's program offered at EHU. And again, the deadline for submission of your applications is July 5th. Uh, I am quite confident, Luis, that we'll meet again. And it's been a pleasure to discuss with you in this very lively manner. Uh, the essential question, right? What is the driver of the behavior of nations? And probably people are, but again, it, as it turns out, in many instances in the life, it's not as easy as it may think, as it may look like. Thank you very much for this webinar. Thank you all who've been watching us and please stay safe and uh, keep in touch with the European Humanities University.